All right, so day one of CIS 126. I want to look at some intermediate to advanced drawing techniques. I have a couple of handouts that I will give you that kind of puts this together as well. But Adobe Animate, I love it because it's such a great way to draw and to animate and to make video games. So what you want to do is plug in your tablet and then start animate. <clears throat> we can create animations and games for a variety of devices for for you know desktops eventually when we create our games we're going to focus on creating games for real devices these are games that will be you know real that people can actually download from the app stores android or mac adobe animate will let us do that eventually if you if you never noticed it let's make something for android let's make something for ios that'll be later but this class is going to be a portfolio showing off that you can do drawing, you can do animating, you can do programming, you can do games. So that's why there's like big four big topics and there'll be maybe subtopics throughout it all. But for the moment, also if you have a USB flash drive, you should plug that in to save your work. Um, don't assume that whatever you save into the network folder or whatever will still be there. It's a public thing, right? So you may lose it. And so um, you can plug that in. And then, of course, at any point, if you're having any trouble, raise your hand. I'll help you out, of course. You can help each other out. But I do ask that you do it at a reasonable volume so you don't distract your neighbor or me. And what we'll do here is let's go up to the File menu, New. File New. Now, this class, I have a few books that are sort of optional, which I'll talk about them a little later. But all of the different concepts in this class are, are in a bunch of different books. And books are expensive and heavy and all of that. So uh, I'm usually going to give you like condensed versions of things. And I'll let you know what might be valuable to, uh, to get when we get to those things. But we'll do a little bit of practice before that. So. I went to create a new project. Uh, we're usually going to work with the dimensions of HD quality, HD quality dimensions. Anyone know what might, what are those dimensions then width and height in standard HD quality? Have you heard of 1080p? So for your width and height, set it to 1920 and uh, height 1080. That's 1080p. That's HD quality. Uh, that's HD quality video. So 1920 by 1080 pixels. Uh, we're not animating just yet, but here we have a frame rate. 24 frame rate would be like for classic high quality animation. We really only care about higher frame rates if we're actually playing games, you know, 60 FPS or higher and such. But this is not going to be any sort of game at the moment. Uh, it's just a little bit of drawing. So. Um, also, what I would recommend here, um, change the background color. This is optional, but I recommend change the background color to a gray color, any gray color. I usually go with this medium gray because eventually, because eventually when you print this out, let's say you colorize your character. You forgot to color the eyeballs because the background color was white. But then when you color it, the eyeballs look transparent and you're seeing another color behind it. So one tip that I like to give is whenever you do these drawings, try to do it on anything besides white because then you'll see all the empty areas that you didn't realize that you didn't color in. So any background color, I'll go with a gray and I'll click OK. Um, do you know the keyboard shortcuts to zoom in and out quickly? Uh, that activates the Zoom tool, yes, but do you know the keyboard shortcuts to zoom in and out like that? Control. Control plus, control minus on the keyboard or the mouse wheel, yes. So you're going to get used to zooming in and zooming out. Control plus on the keyboard zooms in. Control minus zooms out. Or control and then your scroll wheel on the mouse also zooms you in and out.
I would say for the moment, however, go up to the Zoom menu item at the top right over here and select Fit in Window. So it'll zoom it to whatever you need it to be that your whole sheet of paper shows up. This is an untitled document we want to save as, file save as. We're going to save this to our flash drive. It's going to be a little bit of practice. And I've got my flash drive plugged in. If you don't have your flash drive, save it to the desktop or I guess the network folder. But again, I wouldn't rely on that. I'm going to save it to my flash drive and I'll, I'll just um, call it practice with today's date. Today is the 6.10. So call it whatever you want, but I'm calling it that this is my practice file. And I usually title them this way with the year first and then the month and then the day. That way they're all nice and alphabetized. When you're working on your project next month, um, those files will organize themselves in a nice order if you use that, if you use that date scheme. OK, so the, um, these Wacom pen tablets are amazing. And I've used them for years. I remember buying my first one like in, like in the late 90s. They've been around a long time. And they keep getting better and better and better. Uh, one of these newest generations, um, this is the Intuos Pro or something. One of these, they, they have all of these different buttons on the side over here. Um, and we're going to take advantage of these buttons. But if you don't click, don't press it. But if you put your, your finger on top of one of these buttons, you see a pop-up that happens on screen. All of these little buttons can do different things. So don't click it yet, just put your mouse on it. And in my screen, it's kind of tiny. I think yours looks a little better when you, when you put your, mouse on, your finger on it. But you have all of these different buttons. For example, the very first button, if you tap on that, I activated touch mode, which now lets, makes the whole thing into a touchpad. So your, your finger can be used like a, you know, like a touchpad on your, on your laptop. So when you switch it between touch on and off, okay, then now the finger doesn't do anything, just the pen. When you put it on touch mode, now that's that lets you click and drag and then right click if you do with two fingers. So sometimes it's useful instead of instead of getting your hand away from the from the pen to the mouse. You know, the way I work, I'm right-handed, but you can flip these. I have my hand on the tablet over here kind of and then my my hand on the pen. So if my hand's already here, you know, I press the, the button to turn on touch and then I, my hand's already here so I can already just kind of do what I need to on screen instead of letting this go and go grabbing the mouse. You know, I would really get used to these buttons here and I'll talk a lot about, about, about them as we go on. We have a little scroll wheel that lets you do cool things. We have pre-made uh, like keyboard combinations that are going to be so useful, but we'll, we'll cover them. For the moment, I want to switch over to the brush tool. Uh, on the right side, I'm going to select the brush tool, this one here, the regular brush tool. We have a different one, a more artistic brush. We'll go to this regular brush tool, keyboard shortcut B, as in brush. And I think you guys have one strip of icons. Mine's in two. You guys have one strip on the side or two? Uh, one. One. OK. Um, my screen's smaller, so I have it in two strips. But if you want, you can grab that edge and pull it over to get two, like me. But you'll be fine if it's on if it's one column. I have to stretch it out because see, in mine they cut off on my screen. But the point of that is, there's a couple of icons to activate at the very end. Once you've got the brush tool, there's these two icons down here at the bottom. One looks like a little bullseye, and then one looks like the pen falling over. Well, if you put your mouse on top of it to check it, that one is Use Pressure, and that one is Use Tilt. So turn both of those on. And now the pen here uh, will work a thousand times better than the mouse, because it'll work like just like a real sort of pencil that you might have used before. Even if you don't have artistic ability, um, the software really, really, really helps you. So now I have 
this brush tool that if I press lightly, I get a certain sort of a line size. If I press a little harder, I get a thicker size. So just kind of play with that for a moment. Write your name or make a happy face or something. And you're seeing that if you press it lightly, you get these small lines. Press a little harder, you get a thicker line. We can change the size of the brush over here as well. But I'm going to say to get used to using on the keyboard the brackets right next to the letter P. Between the P and the backslash, we have left bracket, right bracket. If you press the right bracket, it makes your, your brush larger. If you press the left bracket several times, it makes it smaller. So that's the same as if I had gone over here to this brush size. But using the, the brackets here on the keyboard next to the P, next to the backslash, next to the enter, you have left and right. So the point of that is I can then start to create, you know, these lines that are, you know, with a little bit more variety and character, not just flat lines, but these, um, these drawings will have like more life when, you know, your brush strokes are varied. There is a style, of course, of simple flat lines, sure. But in the various theories of animation, and I have all of these books that talk about a lot of animation, I'll actually check these books out to you if you want. Um, they talk about the, uh, the appeal of a character. One of the bits of the appeal is like simply like their lines. Instead of flat, simple lines, sometimes a character is more appealing with a variety of lines. And when you have a pressure-sensitive pen like this, it gives you something more detailed. Just play with that for a moment. Just draw something. Or your name, if you're not too artistic. And again, you're not going to be graded on, uh, you know, artistic ability. You're going to be graded on the ability to do things and using the tools and so forth. So use that a little bit. Um, just a show of hands, how many of you had never used this, these Wacom tablets before? Okay, so just try it out just a little bit. Um, just play with it for a moment. I'll show a few more techniques and such. Obviously, if you're having any trouble at any point, raise your hand. Just play with that just a little bit. So the idea is that you're going to develop at least one character. I would say at most. You don't have to get too complex in the short amount of time that we have. With one character, you're going to submit three model sheets. And again, we'll come back to the details of that soon enough. 
and then eventually you're gonna make an animation, an animated movie of at least 30 seconds long. We're gonna go to all the details and learning about parallax scrolling and all that cool stuff. But let's say this is the character I wanted to work with. So I'm gonna do all of my projects as the time goes on based on that character. I can change my mind later on if I don't like it anymore, sure. But again, eight weeks is shorter than you think. And so eventually I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a couple of video games based on that character. So at some point you want to figure out, um, you know, what do you want to work with? What character do you want to make this portfolio out of? Because minding your time, you might not have all of the time that you need in order to uh, do everything you want. So I've got something that I've drawn here. Let's do this. Um, we've got these layers. So layers obviously are like sheets of paper. I'm drawing on a certain sheet of paper. I want to start a new sheet of paper. So down on the layers here, let's click the little uh, lock icon, this little um, dot here to lock it. I don't want to work on that layer anymore. And then I want to click the button to make a new layer. So I've got a brand new layer, layer two. And then I want to hide that first layer also. We've got layer one, which I've locked, which I've hidden. I don't need to see it just yet at the moment. Let's do this. Let's draw a simple circle. Doesn't have to be perfect, but on a new layer, let's draw a circle. I'm going to fill it in with a basic color. So we'll switch over to the Paint Bucket tool, keyboard shortcut K for Paint Bucket. And you want to pick any color besides your outline color. So a circle with a color inside. So try that. Now, when I draw, I'm undoing a lot. I draw like one line, I don't like it, undo, let me do it again. It's amazing to draw on these digital things because every single line you can make perfect. However, at the moment, to undo, you have to go to the keyboard, Control-Z. These tablets can be programmed that all of these buttons on the side do what you want. And I'll show you in a moment, I'm gonna set one of these to be undo, like this one down here. So I'm gonna draw, and as I'm drawing, I made a mistake, undo. Right there, right where my hand is at, I can easily undo because I can remap all of these little buttons. Hello, just have a seat anywhere you'd like and uh, we'll catch you up in just a moment. So we can remap these keys just like in any sort of game. I want to remap my keyboard's uh, shortcuts to do something cool. These can be reprogrammed. So I'll show you eventually. Uh, we want to we wanna remap this because I'm going to undo a lot. But let me come back to that. We've got a circle. We've got a fill color. One of the amazing things about Adobe Animate is that it sees your drawings as mathematical formulas. They are vector-based uh, graphics. So behind it all, there's mathematical formulas. We don't need to care what's happening. But the way it works is we can make drawings that are like separate little pieces of things, and therefore, um, what I want to do here is divide up this simple shape into multiple pieces to add different uh, colors. I'm going to do a little like simple flat cell shading style. We're going to do cell shading, gradient shading, but here's how we can do it with a simple circle. Let's get this line tool. And in the line tool, stroke color, I'll just select any color. I'll go with uh, green. Just any color besides your existing color. I'll draw two lines that kind of cut across it, something like that. So I drew the first lines with the brush tool, and then I'm drawing these other lines with the line tool. The brush tool uses fills, and the line tool uses strokes. You've got a stroke color, a color on the outside, fill color, a color on the inside. Both of them are drawings on my screen, but they behave a different way. Because now, if I get back to my paint bucket, 
and then I drop like a darker color here and then a brighter color here I have divided this original shape into one two three shapes I have three different areas of color three different shapes and when I delete these lines these strokes there will be no gap so if I go back over to the move tool selection tool I mean move tool in Photoshop selection tool and you double click a line to select it completely and delete it on the keyboard and the other one delete it double click it then delete it there is no gap anywhere between those lines and what's cool is I can go to the edge of that straight line and bend it this way or bend it this way and there's no gaps mathematically it's all defined in that there's XYZ colors here in a coordinate plane and these lines are here but there's no gaps in between now let me take that back just to show you again the idea is that one type of drawing was with the brush tool which uses fills and another type of line was with the line tool which uses strokes a stroke a stroke can cut a fill and vice versa and so what happened here is this shape was cut into three and once I remove those st strokes double click delete double click delete there they are and I can push and pull this over here let's say I wanted to do I just pick random colors if I wanted real colors that were sort of like uh, you know cell shading in terms of something is darker and lighter um, I would do it like this. I can start with a base color, the basic color, and get a version of the color that's lighter and a version that's darker. So I can capture or sample this color and then do a brighter and then do a darker version based on that. The way I would do that is I use the um, eyedropper tool. With the eyedropper tool I click on my base color. I go up here to my colors fill color and then on this little color wheel I can mix colors I have right here 200 colors or whatever but it's not the perfect color I can go here after I use the eyedropper to sample the base color I can then go to mix a color and over here switch it over here to the B for brightness we're going to change the brightness now I get a spectrum of colors I want the lighter version of the color so I can fill in the highlight and then I want to drop in a darker version of the color to fill in the shadow basic color theory is there's some color and there's a brighter version closer to the light source and there's a darker version further from the light source so if you kind of look right here with this uh, with these lights right here my hand if you look at my hand side sideways here there's a bright light hitting the, my skin tone right here, and there's a brighter uh, highlights, and on the other side, they're darker. So the light source is making a brighter version of the color, and then there's a central color, and then a darker version on the opposite. So based on over here, I sort of maybe have a light source up here. The light source is pointing this way. So this part of the object is closer to the light source here, so it's brighter. This part of the object is further from the object from the light source, so it's darker. So we're going to cover these things over and over. Um, but the point is that now let me get a brighter version of my color and drop it here. And then let me get a darker version of the color, drop it here. How bright, how dark, well that's all about the practice and your light source and experience and all of that. But the really, really basic thing is that if you've got a light source, um, Let's say I had a light bulb over here. This is a light bulb, sure. And it's sending out light in this direction. So 
something that's closer to the light source would have a brighter color. Something that's further has a darker color. You can get fancy, of course, with gradients and all of that, which we'll cover later. Let's see, I want to do it even brighter over here. So this is going to be very useful. When you're mixing a color, we have B for brightness, and that lets you add dark tones to it. And it might be enough that you also get bright tones. Or if you need to find like the brighter tones that are not bright enough, so let me just go back to show that again. If I start with the basic color, and then I go to uh, to to brightness, I've I'm already gone to the highest brightness. It's not bright enough. So if you switch over to S saturation, then you can add white, and then you can go all the way to white. So B just adds more black to your color for the darker tone. S saturation adds more white for the lighter tone. And what's the perfect color? I can't tell you. The perfect color is the one you picked. The one that does what you need it to do. Let's see, now I've got this object with some light source with some little bit of cell shading. Of course, it could be better, and we will make it better. But if I've got, if I've got this object with some brightness and shading on it from a light source, what do you think might be missing on it to make it more realistic? Shadow. Shadow, exactly, on the, on, on, on the plane, wherever it's at. So this is where you can get fancy. You have separate layers. And then I can draw a shadow because it's on its own separate layer. It doesn't affect the layer, the thing on top, right? I'm, oops, I'm drawing on the top. No, it's on a separate layer, so I don't see it. And obviously, I'm just kind of doing this a little quickly, but this is showing you that you'll have lecture. I'm recording it all. You'll be able to replay it. You'll have lab time to practice. You'll have specific things you need to accomplish in an assignment. You'll be creating real things, not something just out of a book, which I think is very academic. You're going to create things that you will care about. Um, this, I'm liking how it's looking, although I have this like really weird thing up here. What is that, a cowlick or something? So, because, depending how you drew it, if you didn't make that mistake like I did, don't worry about it, but look at this. Uh, you can have, of course, the eraser tool, and I'll go to the eraser and erase it. That's a waste of time. The The thing about the this type of drawing is that all of these uh, all of these fills and strokes, they're all independent units, and you can do weird things like we saw here, like, well, actually, maybe I want the, um, maybe I want this highlight just a little bit like that, or maybe a bigger highlight, right? So you can see that we can grab all these edges and change them. But the really weird and interesting thing you can do with Adobe Animate is this. Once you overlap some of these shapes, they sort of interact with each other. So watch this. I'm going to grab the edge of this shape and pull it out over here. And when I let it go, it cuts away a piece that was overlapped too much. Now again, you might not have that issue, but I do. I've got this extra piece. And so if you overlap something like that, it cuts it out. Look at that. I'm, I'm kind of erasing it without the eraser. I didn't use the eraser. I overlapped one thing on top of another thing to, to cut that out. Now, the eraser will work just fine. But I've used this so many times, like if I'm drawing a real character, and we'll have practice with this, I'm drawing a real character right here, and I make something go too far like that. Well, I could use the eraser tool. But if I grab this corner and overlap it with that corner, it cuts it. I can drag this corner, overlap it with that corner, and cut it. Select that, delete it. Again, I'll show this a little slower in a moment. But this is a technique here to, to refine what you drew. So you saw there a moment ago, I had all these lines. Whoops, I had all of these lines that were weirdly overlapping. And I did these special tricks. I'll come back to that. But 
I've got here like a basic ball shape. Let me pause there. Maybe practice with that. Draw another one. Make another layer. Draw another another ball or square or something. Try to do the same thing we just did right there. Draw something with a color. Use the lines to divide it up and fill it with different colors. What if I make a brand new layer? And then with the brush tool, you know, what if I try to get more complex with a face? And then drop some Simpson skin tones on this. This is one example also why I'm saying try to draw with a gray background instead of a white background, because then I never filled in those colors. If I had left it as a white background, I would have had a false sense of security that it was filled in. With the line tool, I can then draw a line like this. And of course, this is kind of advanced stuff which we'll get practice with. This is when the zooming in and out really helps. There's this uh, magnet that I really don't like most of the time when you're when you're using the selection tool or the line tool. Sometimes these lines just jump where you don't want them to go. So I usually turn off that magnet. And the point of these lines is for me to define these areas where I can do this sort of flat uh, cell shading. some shapes and then kind of divide up the shapes with the with the uh, line tool So all of these particular lines that I drew, you know, I'm drawing all over the place to divide up the shapes to fill them in, but they don't affect the original drawing. And once I delete, if I double click one of these lines, if it's the same color as the adjacent line, so if I double click this one and press delete, they all delete, it doesn't affect each other. So um, try that a moment, just kind of divide things up.
Alright, anyone having any trouble? Does it make sense a little bit? The more we practice, the more it'll make sense, but you want to draw something. Uh, you want to see the big idea that um, these are sort of like discrete shapes. If you draw with the plain old pencil tool, that kind of works as well, but the problem with that is that if I'm drawing, you know, I'm, I'm making um, a face over here, but if I'm trying to do the same trick about about adding colors, the problem with that is then when I try to remove that line in the middle, well, everything was that same color, so if I delete, everything deletes. If you are using the pencil, I would say then uh, switch your colors. You know, if I fill in these colors here, um, then I'm going to switch my pencil to a different color. If these colors are the same color, when you try to delete it, it'll see it as the same color and then it will it will then not delete it. So the big idea is to have different color lines and then when they overlap with each other and such they they cut each other out. Now, I'm going to pass you some files. I'm going to give you some handouts. Um, I'm going to give you some handouts that I think are going to be very useful. All right, so let's do this. Save your work for a moment, and then let's minimize uh, Adobe Animate for a moment. I want to give you some files. Uh, so minimize to the desktop, and let's open up the, uh, the web design folder. So let's go to the web design folder, and we have a new folder in here, CIS 126. And inside of CIS 126, uh, copy this folder to your desktop or flash drive, better yet your flash drive. I'm going to put these items in the... Uh, uh, in, in Canvas, of course, but for the moment, uh, copy them over to your desktop. A copy of the syllabus is also there, but it's also on Canvas. Just copy that over to your desktop, then we'll look at what's in there. And if you've got a flash drive, you want those files there. But copy that. It's Topic 1, Digital Drawing 0, Handouts. We're going to have, again, four big topics. Topic 1 is about drawing. Topic 2 is animating. Topic 3 is game number one, and topic four is game number two. So I'll have various handouts and so forth. Uh, let's look at that first hand, uh, that first folder, topic one, handouts. I mention a few books. I got these books. I got these handouts as scans for some of these books. If you want uh, the books yourselves, you can get the full details about them. And I have some of them in, in real life right here. Uh, if you do want to look through them, th these are also going to be like, you know, you, you, I can check them out to you during the class time if you turn in something to check them out with before we do that. Uh, I have all of these different ones, and they're kind of numbered in a certain order. There's this one here first about the 12 techniques. This is, this is a, the classic 12 techniques of animation. There's this theory that to make like really good animation, there's these 12 concepts that you need to kind of understand in order to make you know these drawings into something realistic. The classic Disney animation follows this. A lot of Western animation follows this. Um, anime and such also follows some of them. And you're of course, um, you know, the more you learn about this, the, the better you'll you'll get at all of this. But 
I'm not going to go through the whole pages, but this is coming out from this book over here, I think. Yeah. So if you want to see it in actual physical copy at some point, you can check out the book. Uh, but okay, there's a little bit of theory, and then it goes, what are the principles? The more of these that you know and understand and can apply, the better your animations will be. So something about squash and stretch, arcs, timing, exaggeration. <clears throat> So each one kind of gives you an example. Here's a bouncing ball. And so this all happens like at, you know, 24 frames per second. All of this happens very quickly. But these like little details uh, makes, make this drawing like more realistic. Even though it's getting exaggerated here, this shows that this hit the ground and then it kept bouncing. So you can check all of these out on your own, and the book goes on to more detail over here about what these all mean. So again, you can check these out during class. The next handout over here from this other book, uh, How to Draw Manga. So this is showing uh, using kind of what we talked about here. Uh, ladies, do you have a question here? So this is a technique here about if you're drawing these lines, like with the, uh, with, the, with the line tool, we have a special tool that will help you clean up your lines. This example that shows you there, like if I've got these lines, okay, I'm just going to draw two lines like this. We have this special mode in the eraser. In the erase tool, we have this water faucet, and what that does is it deletes lines that overlap. So if I zoom in right here, see how these lines are overlapping? With the eraser tool, well, of course, I can go in and erase it and waste my time erasing it perfectly. Instead, with the eraser tool, I have this option right here, faucet, and then I click here and it deletes it, or here. So wherever these lines overlap, you use the eraser plus the faucet tool, faucet mode, that is, and it erases those items. So the example in the book is, is saying, like, what if I, what if I use the, the pencil tool, you know, and I'm trying to draw eyes, uh, you know, something like that, and there's these parts over here that I want to get rid of. So, you know, I'm trying to draw an eyeball here, and I've got all these lines that are not quite overlapping properly with the eraser tool set to faucet wherever you click where there's an overlap you can easily delete those lines right there and right there right there now this works with the line tool anything that makes strokes so the line tool not the brush tool the brush tool behaves a little differently but that handout there that I'm showing you, you saw how I kind of had it like a little bit loose. And then now I'm going in and erasing some of these overlap the overlapping lines like that. Now the eyebrow is perfect. Maybe I want to take out that. So eraser plus faucet. That's that particular handout. Let's see what else here. Highlights and shadows. This is what we started to play with a little bit. This is even more complex, though. We have this character's hair. So obviously, you have to draw the hair, etc. It got filled in with a basic color. Then they use the line tool, a stroke tool, to draw these overlapping, they call it mountains, all of these overlapping items. So they overlap in a bunch of different ways. Wherever they overlap, it's a separate area of a shape to fill in a different color. If I try it out here, let's see it a new layer. I'm going to maybe just draw something really basic. I'll draw someone with really cool anime hair. So I can 
can go in and remove some of these things. So if I fill in a basic color, the handout there is talking about you fill in a basic color and then you can divide up your 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 shapes so using the line tool with some color besides your basic color and I can go in here and draw some areas that might be the highlights or the shadows so I've got this basic area of color I've divided it up with the, with the stroke tool I've got these fills plus the stroke. The stroke is dividing up the shapes. Now I've got an area there where I can fill in the dark color. So the same technique with the circle. I sample the basic color. I go to my color mixer over here and get a darker version. You know, the darker, the more dramatic. And then I sample the color to do a brighter version. highlights over here and then all of these lines are still separate units I can delete them all double clicking and delete them and obviously I need to work on it a little bit more but I'm starting to get oops, I'm starting it, it actually doesn't show up on the projector oh, that's funny. on my screen there is a highlight here you can barely see it on the projector so I'll make it brighter color right here is that visible yeah it's visible right there so that handout that I'm looking at at the moment is talking about dividing up these shapes uh, to fill it in with colors and I get a cell shading sort of style and it walks you through there after you remove those those lines you start to get this the same concept of there's going to be an area with the darker version of the color there's an area with the lighter version of the color when it all comes together then you have this classic cell shading style dark areas okay so on the four directions of the compass where would you say the light source is coming from above the head somewhere over here top left somewhere Yep, it looks like over here somewhere. That's what I'm seeing here, exactly. Because on the right side is where the shadow is falling. On the left side somewhere, top left, somewhere left, the highlight is happening. And so on the very basic theory of shading, just be very simple and like, is, is the light coming from the left, the top, the right, the bottom? Yeah, if it's a three-dimensional character, maybe it's coming at them. Well, that's a whole other complication. Or maybe it's coming from behind them. That's even more complicated. But here, just very simply, it seems to be coming from the top left. You know, at an angle like this. And we see that there's some dark over here, but then there's a bounce reflection over here, but then over here there's a light from the left, shadow, shadow, etc. So in basic theory right here, okay, how did I draw mine? Where's the light source coming from mine? From above. Yeah. So I see the brightness up above and then the shadow below. When I fill in the skin tones, well, somewhere down here at the bottom will be the darker skin tones. Somewhere up here will be the lighter. Yes, the hair then casts its own shadow on the skin tone, and what about the nose and all of that? Of course, there's a lot of complication. But on the very basic is, think about it that way. You have this light source. Things closer to the light source are brighter. Things further from the dark source, the light source, are darker. See a couple more. Okay, here's one about gradients. Uh, I won't get to this one just yet, but you can do really cool gradients. You know, you can make these highlights that happen here, blending these colors really well with gradients. I'll come back to that a little later. I like this handout also because, you know, it just really shows you, uh, you have all of these shapes of basic color. When you then separate them, 
you then are able to add flat color or gradient color. And then there, that the, the, her, her, her face at the very beginning looks very flat, but then as, as you see the line over here, dividing it halfway here, and then filling it in with two gradients, you get this depth of like the cheeks, and then the hair falling on the face and all of that, and you end up with that. It still has a mixture of both. Look at this hair over here. This is this shape over here. This is a stylized hair shape. You know, maybe it should be more spiky. It's not wrong. It, when it all comes together, look at these dark areas of shadow here. I think this highlight here is a little off, personally. These highlights here are good, and the shadows, maybe this should have something too. They didn't add any shadows or highlights on this strand. It's not wrong, maybe until I pointed it out, you might not have noticed it, but when it all comes together, little pieces all together, they all make something in total. There's a cool one over here about various skin tones. So if you don't know where to start with making skin tones, these give you right here these color formulas uh, to pick over here. So. 248201187 um, and eye colors and skin colors. So those are colors that I would get them out over here. Um, you go to your mixer. Actually, let me do it like this. So you go over here. You go up here to this mixer, and then you've got. RGB. This is where you would plug in these these numbers here. RGB. So 180, 105, 51 for a skin tone. You can lighten it and darken it from here, but I like this handout as a way to get started with skin tones if you want to deal with uh, humanoid characters. Obviously, you're you're not limited in the class to to deal with human characters. We saw on the printouts on the back, we've got a panda over there and like a cat and a duck. And then like a wolf warrior and a little robot, a little round robot drone thing. So you are able to create any kind of characters for the class. And these other ones, you can look at these on your own a little bit later. Let's let's take our first break. We've been here a little while. Um, so if you've got something that you're playing with like that, remember to save it. If you want to keep it, you're not going to turn this in. There's going to be something else to turn in after the break. We'll talk about that, but it's too... Um, 2.30, we'll take a break until 2.40, just a quick 10-minute break, and we'll come back to do a little bit more.